From KCRW, this is Nocturne. Hi, this is Vanessa. The last episode, On the Air, was based on an interview with Rod Quinn, who hosts the late-night show Overnights on ABC Radio in Australia. Sometime before I interviewed Rod, he interviewed me for Overnights. We had a great time talking about a wide range of nocturnal topics and talking to the listeners who called in to share their feelings and observations about the night. Rod was kind enough to let me share part of that night's show with you as a bonus of sorts. We'll be back in a few weeks with another episode of Nocturne. Now, here's Overnights with Rod Quinn. Overnights with Rod Quinn on ABC Radio. Maybe Bob Dylan had it right when he sang, Ain't it just like the night to play tricks when you're trying to be so quiet? Or maybe Bruce Springsteen, who observed that there are some things that can only be found in the darkness on the edge of town. Or when he's saying, it feels right as you lock up the house, turn out the lights and step out into the night. What is it about the night, about what happens in the darkness when most people are asleep? Everyone but you and me. People working, people who can't sleep, people who prefer to stay awake in the wee small hours because they can get work done or won't be distracted or are inspired by the night. The podcast Nocturne by Vanessa Lowe explores what happens in the hours between when the sun goes down and when it rises again the next morning. We know what goes on at night because we're here sharing the night together, as Dr. Hook might have said. But what has Vanessa Lowe found? Vanessa is with us this morning, and welcome to Overnights. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Why? Why are you so interested in what happens at night? Well, um, it's it's kind of funny, actually, because I am not a night owl, um, which is part of the reason that I do this podcast, is that uh, for me... The night is sort of this uncharted territory. It's a, it's a kind of parallel universe that um, I didn't always have a lot of comfort with, had fascination for, but I didn't feel like I really had maps for the night. And so I set out to explore it and to learn more about it and to maybe gain more comfort with it. Um, there's, there's so much mystery and, uh, and hidden behavior and hidden environments, just mm. so many things that occur at night that people that aren't night owls wouldn't know about. And you, you know, guys. yeah, it, but until I started working, I didn't, uh, through the night, I didn't realize there was a 4 a.m. I thought it was just 4 p.m. <laughs> yeah, so, <enough. laughs> uh, yeah. You talk about night owls, but you also talk about, you know, being up with the larks, but you say that most people are neither night owls or larks. Yeah, that seems to be what I found. Um you know, there's just, I think, I think actually a lot of, a lot of night owls or people that sort of kind of play it both ways, they just don't, they're not really out about it because there's a little bit of a, a, a bias against people that are up at night. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, what are they, there's, there's the lark. The hummingbird. The hummingbird. Yes, I am more of a, and I think most people tend to be more hummingbirds. Um, you know, but then different periods of your life might lend themselves more to being one or the other. Like, for instance, I recently got a new dog, um, and, and he's been waking me up at 4.30 in the morning. And so, and I've really been enjoying that because I get to see the sunrise and the, I hear the dawn chorus, and suddenly I'm a lark. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's all dependent, surely, as I feel about this anyway, about how much sleep you need or when you can sleep. Mm -hmm. If you don't have to get up and go to work, and maybe, you know, you're retired or you don't have a job and that doesn't worry you or you've got a new baby or something like that, mm -hmm. then, sure, you can be awake during the night. If you are craving sleep, your experience of the night is very different to other people's, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's sort of uh, a terror for, you know, for people that would like to be sleeping and can't. I mean, I think that's part of, 
a little bit of what was going on for me right before I started doing Nocturne is that I was having insomnia and I was waking up in the middle of the night. And at that time of night, everything looks kind of sinister. Um, if you don't have the right kind of lighting, particularly, everything's glary and it hurts your brain to look around. And I was finding I'd walk through my house and it just was an unpleasant place to be at that time of night. Whereas during the day, it would just, it would, it was quite pleasant and, and enjoyable to be in my home. Mm. So yeah, I think if you're, if you're craving sleep, it's, it's a pretty awful experience. But then of course, um, if you're, if you're not craving sleep, it can be quite delightful. Indeed. So you talk about the darkness or the night, but mm. darkness in particular, because that's, that's you know, kind of separate to night. There's night and there's darkness. We know that the night is dark, but not as dark as it used to be, and I'll get to that dark. in a moment. Mm. But you talk about darkness being a blank canvas. Mm. Why is that? What are you talking about? Um, More so than the daytime, perhaps. Yeah, I think part of it is we know less about it often, most people. Um, and so you can project a lot of your emotions onto this, this time of day, whether that's fears or worries or mystery, intrigue. Um, so there's, there's that element of it is that we, we sort of, and also what culture tells us happens at night, is it dangerous? Yeah. You know, so, we can, so it's a blank canvas in that way. But I also think it's a blank canvas in that there's just less, generally, less going on. There's less of sort of the buzz of human activity and um, and so I've talked to a lot of creative people, musicians and artists who love creating at night, and and a lot of them have the experience that they can they can create more because there's less of a distraction of this sort of sure. background hum going on. And I'm thinking of the the Beatles, for example. They really became at their best when there was no restriction. They would work all night mm-hmm. on those later albums. The mm-hmm. worst time for them was when they were making Let It Be and they had to be there at nine in the morning to start being creative and that just didn't suit them and I'm sure a lot of other musicians work through the night, they record there and that's when they can paint on their canvas. Yeah, and I think too, like, um, when you're doing music in that way, you know, you're, you're sort of counterculture, right? You're sort of, you're trying to do something different and unique and so that kind of, you know, I think that works better when you're not sort of in the lockstep of the daily routines that everybody has. You know, it, there's just like the schedule that everyone's sort of locked into. Uh, but at night, people are freed from that more. And so I think maybe your mind and your creativity can kind of stretch out more. So why are we afraid of the dark? Ah, <laughs> I've been trying to figure that out and explore that. Um, I'm actually, the episode I'm working on right now turns out to be with a, a professor at a university in Sydney over in your neck of the woods. Um, and I'm actually, it's, a, it's an episode about um, nefarious people at night and it's sort of a relationship between the night and people that are up to no good. Um, so, there, you know, when I was talking to him, his name is Peter, Dr. Peter Jonathan, he was citing research uh, about how there actually is more crime at night. And I, I have heard different things about that. It's, it's not that the same everywhere. But that, um, you know, there, there is the reality that fewer people are awake, and so if you're up to no good, uh, you're probably less likely to be detected and, and apprehended and punished if you do those things at night. And also, since most people tend to wind down at around 10 o'clock, they're less alert and maybe less able to defend themselves against people with bad intentions. Yeah. And so in that, in that way, you know, potentially, yeah, there's, there's more danger at night because people that are up to no good kind of have a better arena to do their bad actions. Yeah. Now, not only that, but nearly every horror film, every mm. great horror one is set at night. And they yeah. have to get, if they can just get to daylight, to get to the dawn, they'll be okay. They have to get through the night. Are there, I wonder that, like, it would almost be scarier in a way if, a good horror movie happened during the day. But, yeah, well, also at night, you know, there's, there are fewer people there to help you, <laughs> to come, yes, like, exactly. come to the rescue. <laughs> um, you mentioned um, the, the chap you're working with at um, Sydney University, but you've been to Australia, and, in fact, that uh, forms a really important part of one of uh, the podcast episodes. You went to Art After Hours at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. So normally the Art Gallery closes at 5 o'clock, Everyone yeah. spills out in the street and that's it. But on Wednesday nights, they're open till 9 or 10. Mm-hmm. How is an art gallery different, firstly at night, and then ah. secondly, 
in the dark when there's nobody there? Because Art After Hours, of course, it's filled with people and you went on a particularly yeah. boisterous night. Yeah. How is that different? Oh, that was fascinating. I also had my 11-year-old son with me. And um, to, to show a child in a museum uh, in a, in a, at night with a different kind of programming, you know, we saw a man, um, a naked man, sheathed in, in plastic that he was using for wings, dancing around, and it was oh, quite fascinating and entertaining. And, and it felt like, you know, and there were, um, there were drag queens leading tours through the museum and giving alternate uh, uh, interpretations of the paintings. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that kind of thing could happen at night again because... It's, 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 it's the work routines and the respectable expectations have lessened by that time, right? And so it's, uh, there's a more playful kind of, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, more playful kind of permission that, that people have. I actually didn't, the, the, the other part of that episode was um, another producer, Kathy Fitzgerald, who's a British producer, um, had gone to a museum in London mm. at night in the, or, and had interviewed people that are there at, in the dark. I've actually never been to a museum right. that's dark at night. However, but, you know, just imagine for a moment, mm-hmm. like if you are the Mona Lisa, for example, mm-hmm. and you are being looked at all day long by thousands of people, surely yeah. when the lights get switched off, you can just relax for a moment and think, oh, yeah. I don't have to look my best. Exactly. It makes me think of when I, you know, at the end of the day when I change into my pajamas, there's just this delicious feeling where you just, <laughs> like, relax. I imagine the Mona Lisa just kind of shaking out her hair and going, oh, finally. (laughs) Thank you for listening to this KCRW podcast. In case you don't know us, KCRW is public radio in Los Angeles, bringing the best of NPR to Southern California. We're also known for our own brand of bold and innovative programming, evocative storytelling, taste-making music, and audio documentaries that are little movies for your ears. You can join our community to support this show and others, or make a one-time donation just to say thank you. Find out more at kcrw.com slash join. Vanessa Lowe is our guest from the podcast Nocturne, which Beyond just investigating or just taking a different look at what happens at night, it's also superbly put together. Just the the way it's crafted and the music is really beautifully done. So congratulations on that. Who is awake during the night? Um, Who's awake? Who have you Uh, found? Artists, bakers, uh, truck drivers. (laughs) They're all Um, listening now, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um people with migraines, people with different chronotypes who truly are, have an inverted sleep schedule, um, lovers. Um, gosh, I mean, there's so many people who are being disturbed by wildlife, like mockingbirds or dogs barking or mosquitoes. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing when you, really, when you really think about it, when, it, when, you, when you think... Oh, yeah, not everybody's lying down in bed. There are people worrying, thinking they're alone and not realizing maybe the person right across the way from them is also sitting up feeling utterly alone, worrying, and that if they just, if they just knew that that other person was there having a similar experience, yeah. a weight would be lifted and, and the night would be tra- transformed for them. So what difference is there, do you think, between those who are awake at work during the night and those who are awake because they're doing something that they probably want to do. Is there any difference? I think there's a huge difference from the people I've talked to. Um, many people have to work at night for economic reasons or because, you know, they, they are a caretaker for a child or a loved one during the day, so they have to do their job at night. And it's brutal if that's not your chronotype, your natural inclination for when you're going to be awake. Um, yeah, I think it, it can be, and then particular people that do swing shifts where it's not a consistent schedule have it the worst yeah. because they have all sorts of health problems and an emotional fallout from that versus people that just, my, my partner actually, his, oh, an 11 or 12 at night hits, like he's just, he, he hits this incredible flow and he can just be down in his studio making music for hours and just be the happiest person in the world. And he says to me, why don't you, know, if you have, if you can't finish your work, just stay up and do it. And I'm like, oh, that, I, can't, I can't do a thing past, you know, past midnight. We'll take calls in a moment from people to tell us what they are doing or why they are up at this time of the night. If you're working, maybe if you're not working, 
Now, Paper Chucker has texted and texts a lot, and a paper chucker throws newspapers over mm. fences at night. <laughs> and um, for him and a lot of drivers, it's safer driving at night because yeah. we can see more around us in regards to vehicles on the road with headlights and things like that. So some people do like working at night, maybe because it is safer. Yeah. You talk about the disappearing dark, how gas stations, as you say, or petrol stations at maybe 10 times brighter than they need to be or uh, convenience stores are very, very bright, far brighter than they need to be, that we're losing the stars because of the, the lights of the city as well and people just never get to experience those things anymore. Yeah, it's a huge, huge problem that's really fairly recent. It happened pretty fast. Um, you know, with the gas station example, you know, certainly lights do get humans' attention. So if you're trying to draw people to your business, uh, that, that works great. Problem being that it disrupts wildlife, it, and it, it impairs humans' ability to see the stars and, you know, and, and all that happens when you look at the stars, the pondering of the greater universe and our place in it. Um, also, though, there's this kind of illusion that more light leads to more safety. And that may be true in certain circumstances, but the thing people don't realize is blasting light in the middle of the night creates shadows where actually, you know, someone up to no good has a place to hide and you have lim- more limited ability to detect them. Um, but there's a lot of research about how uh, artificial light at night disrupts wildlife and also it, it has negative effects on health for human beings. Mm. Um, outside and then inside, we light up our homes at night, not just with electric light, but with our devices, which also emanate a blue light, which signals our brains to activate and stay alert, which is the exact opposite thing we want to have happen when we're about to go to sleep. And that has all sorts of effects, not just in terms of sleep disruption, but um, there endocrine disorders and potentially sure. cancers and things like that. So it's really it's, it's a much bigger issue than people realize. There's a really fascinating episode of the podcast, and the name of the podcast is Nocturne, and Vanessa Lowe is our guest, about a place called Point Richmond mm. that had the street lighting changed, and it just seemed to change the personality of the entire town. Not just the, yeah, not just the personality of the entire town, but actually lights blasted into people's windows yeah. and kept them awake. And so that's a really interesting and kind of complicated issue, and in a way it's emblematic of sort of the larger issue. So Richmond, Point Richmond is part of Richmond, right? And Richmond is a city in the Bay Area, um, California, Northern California, which has historically had like a lot of problems with crime and um, uh, gang activity and... Um, so what the city of Richmond was trying to do was increase street lighting to increase safety for areas that really did need it. What they didn't do was evaluate how Point Richmond, which is part of the larger city, is different than the rest of Richmond. And Point Richmond is a little hilly area with gorgeous sort of historic houses um, and a very different feeling to this other area that they were trying to do something good by lighting it. And they had no desire in Point Richmond to have any changes to their lighting. They were never asked, and all of a sudden these lights just appeared. And people got very, very upset and, uh, you know, got a lot of the lights taken away. But before they did, there were all sorts of problems with street lights just illuminating homes as though they were in the middle of a gas station at night and keeping people awake and... Um, and also, uh, you know, it affects moth populations and moths are pollinators and you know, all sorts of things, right. unforeseen consequences. Fascinating stuff. And yeah. I urge people to listen to that episode as well. Um, we'll take some calls, one three hundred eight hundred triple two. If you'd like to tell us why you're awake right now. Now, I will point out that Vanessa has to leave us in about 25 minutes, so you'll have the chance to talk to her for that period of time. one three hundred eight hundred triple two. Why are you awake now? What are you doing now? Perhaps are you choosing to be awake here at night? What do you like about being awake now? Or that you like about the dark? We're told to be afraid of the dark, but the dark is also warm and enveloping as well. It, it can be a really beautiful thing to be part of. Just also part of this disappearing dark, though. You know, so many things happen now that used to happen during the daytime. I'm talking about sporting events and concerts, and even they have open-air cinemas now 
that are screened at night. So that things that we used to, you know, do in natural light on natural grass is now this artificial experience where, because of TV, of course, all the major sporting events are all held at night now. How does that change things as well? Yeah, I haven't really thought about that very much. I mean, I think in some ways, right, it, it makes it more exciting because you're inhabiting, you're having these normally daytime things happen at a time they didn't formally inhabit. So that's kind of cool and exciting. But then, in a way, right, like that time is no longer protected. It's no longer all those cues that signal us this is time to wind down and, and we can turn our brains off and start to center back into ourselves and have our time of renewal with sleep or whatever else we do at night in a quiet way. That kind of like that's another thing that vanishes um, with the things that take place outside, and then also the fact that we basically here I am where I am it's eleven o'clock in the morning. You yes. know, so at any time of night, you don't really have to go into that alone space that that used to happen at night, and and that can be I guess comforting, but also there's something that's lost there. Well, also night is quieter generally. Generally. But not always, because, say, radio stations. If you're listening to the radio at night, you can pick up stations from all over the place, from a long way away, that you just simply can't get during the daytime, can you? Yeah, but that's also that's an artificial thing that happens because of our, our human technology. In a way, I, somebody asked me recently, somebody I know that's researching silence, um, asked me, like, what, what would be one thing that I would want to have happen to be, allow me to get in touch with silence. I thought, wouldn't it be great if there were 20 minutes every day where nobody could do any yeah. technology or communication? And, and I, that's kind of what the night used to be. Mm. And, and I miss that sort of enforced, I yes. don't know, isolation or just sort of downtime because you don't have to have it anymore. I think that's one of the problems also with public holidays, just going off on a tangent, is that they are now just seen as another day for entertainment and shopping rather than <laughs> just actually, you know what, on this day, no one's going to do anything and you mm. don't have to go out to a movie at 10 in the morning or you yeah. don't have to watch a sporting <laughs> event. A couple of uh, texts before we take, a lot of people want to talk to you, by the way. Martin says, being my father's carer for five years until his passing, I'm still up at 3 a.m. every morning. Eric says, um, my brain won't sleep until it's exhausted. Mm. And Jay says, I worked in hospitality for 18 years and still struggle with a day schedule even after 10 years away from that. I wow. now work as a rural pool manager. Season has finished for a few months so I can enjoy being up late. Interesting, isn't it? All right, Thomas has an unusual, well, maybe not unusual reason to be up late. Thomas, good morning. Uh, good morning. How you go? Uh, fine, thanks, Thomas. Quite a few people have either been victims of unkindness or have been guilty of unkindness. And for both people, they are ultra-sensitive yep. to all sorts of things and they often cannot get to sleep, you know? Is that your situation? I think so to some degree. All right, Thomas. Pro pro probably probably uh, to some degree uh, victims and a little bit guilty too. Okay. And I have known I'm not the only one and it can be disturbing. So you, so you turn on radio and you feel a little bit soothed or you get up and go for a walk yeah. halfway through the night or something. It's not so not so easy. Sometimes you wish you could have changed the world and turned the clock back, but you know what? You cannot do that. Mm. Thomas, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. Vanessa. Thoughts, really, thoughts have a, a way of taking hold at night, whether it's guilty thoughts or, or, or sad thoughts, right? They, they kind of find their foothold when there's not much else going on. You know, when something is on your mind, you simply cannot sleep. Mm -hmm. And you might want to, it just will not happen. Chris, good morning. Oh, good morning. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Rod. Hi. Um, yeah, that ties in with the creative soul in a sense, doesn't it? Because creatives tend to be a lot more sensitive mm. to a degree. But um, I was listening years ago to, I think it was Ian Hickey from Beyond Blue, who was saying 10% of us are extreme night owls, 10% of us are early birds, and the rest falls somewhere in between. And for me, I, I'm afraid I'm the night owl. <laughs> I don't really get started till 
till darkness falls, and then then suddenly the brain kicks in, and beyond that, I'm some some nonbulent. Uh, I will point out. Uh, I think Ian Hickey was, uh, well, still is with the Brain and Mind Institute, so he would have studied all that. I suppose if you are, thanks very much, Chris. Um, if you're lucky, if you are a night owl, quite literally, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like working at night, but if you like staying up and you can get a job at night, that's perfect, isn't it, Vanessa? Yeah. It's if you are so so lucky. You were mentioning earlier, I think, before we started uh, being on the air about. Uh, one of the episodes, a person who is a, a reporter, a news reporter yep. at, at night, and she just felt, feels like she hit the jackpot. She found work that perfectly coincides with her chronotype, her, her natural inclination, and then it's just a joy. Exactly. You know, she sits at, in the middle of the night with her, her various animals draped across her, sipping her cup of tea wrapped in a blanket, wow. and she's productive. <laughs> and, and she's socially recognized for it, mm. which is the other thing. You know, a lot of people that are night owls, uh, society views them as sort of less than upstanding. But if you actually can find work where you're productive, then you, you don't deal with that problem as much because you're contributing to society. Okay. Now, I might point out that the Riverina is an area of Australia which is very much one of the food bowls of this country. And Brett is there. Good day, Brett. Hello, Rod and Vanessa. Hi. I'm up, I'm up with the owls. Checking, yep. the, checking the water to make sure I've got plenty of food for my cows. Okay. And how long does that take you to do? And Are you up all uh-huh. night? No, I'm up... Well, I can be up any time of the night, Rod, changing it. And, um, yeah, it's, look, it's something I like to do because I know I'm going to have feed in it, you know, for the cows. Sure. Mm-hmm. And if I'm not doing that, I'm quite often up during the night helping a cow calve, so... That must be an incredible experience, too. It is. It's it's great. You know, you, you're you helping the cow calf, and the calf comes out, and it's, the first thing it does is eyes pop open and look at you and say, thanks very much. <laughs> thanks, Brett. <laughs> we love uh, people down in the Riverina. Um, that's another thing, isn't it, Vanessa? Like vets or doctors or paramedics who are called out into the night. Mm. Things are always worse at night. Or, you know, if babies are born in the middle of the night or cows are calving or things like that. Yes, yes. I actually, I have an episode coming up about a, a midwife who goes out in the middle of the night and you're on your own more in, the, in some very intense situations, right? So a police officer or an emergency worker who goes out at night, in some ways they have the weight of that, of that uh, emergency situation on their shoulders in a way that the, the day worker doesn't with all the yeah. backup. Well, you know, also, when you're driving along at night and you see those flashing blue lights mm. or red lights, that looks far worse at night. It uh, does, doesn't it? It yeah. really does. Bushy, who's out there in the outback Queensland. G'day, Bushy. Yes, good morning, Rod. Good morning, Vanessa. How are we? Very morning. Well. Um, look, uh, I get up at 1 o'clock every morning. I listen to Rod's show, I just might add, every Thank single you. morning. But in saying that... Um, I, uh, I, you don't mind, but I shoot wild dogs slash dingoes to protect the farmers. Um, yep. A lot of farmers can lose up to 30, 40 sheep per night. Wow, that's a lot. Wow. And the, the dogs actually kill for the sake of killing. It's like, it's like an enjoyment. They might kill these sheep and eat a, eat, eat a kangaroo, for example. They, yeah. they, so I'm, um, I'm, and why do you have to do that at night? Why is that at night? Because we often see, you know, blokes spotlighting kangaroos and whatever. Why isn't that done during the daytime? Because the animals are far more active of night time. The amount of activity of nocturnal animals and night time, for some reason, the animals are, are just far more active. Now, you might notice tonight the moon, a large moon, that's going to set in about the next half hour on the east coast. Right. Um, it, it, it's beautiful. The animals are very, very active on the, on the, when the moon's high like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, yeah, it's just I've done it for a long, long time, actually about to retire at the end of the year. It's a job that I enjoy. It's a job I've done a long time. And what you see of the night time is extraordinary. Like what? It's, Give us one thing, absolutely extraordinary thing you've seen. Oh, you see some, well, you never see owls, what they call a <laughs> hour of a night, right. you know, I mean, of a daytime. You see them of a, but you do see them of a night time when I'm traipsing through the bush. They're active. Mm. Or a lot of, most animals are active. During the, during the, and it's, um, you know, you see, fall, while I'm working, I see falling stars. The, 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 the stars are beautiful. Really beautiful of a night time. They fairly the blaze at midnight, Bushy. 
Mm-hmm. They're beautiful. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, as I said, I'm retiring at the end of this year and I'm really going to miss it and I don't know if I'll ever sleep again. Oh, right. <laughs> hey, thanks, Bushy, and uh, Bushy texts a lot and I'm, I appreciate the fact that you've called in. The stars, that is something else that you've talked about in, in your podcast and mm-hmm. Vanessa Lowe is our guest, Nocturne is the podcast, that when you go out into the bush, as we call it in Australia, out into the country areas, you see how many stars there are. It is an unbelievable sight. You get out, away from the towns even to mm-hmm. see these stars. In some cities, you would never see the stars, say in New York or somewhere like that. Yeah, I grew up in New York City, and I really had this perception of the sky at night as sort of a milky gray thing with a little bit of scattered something that, that's light lit up there. And I recently, after I started Nocturne, I started searching for the Milky Way. I had never seen it. Um, and it really became apparent, and I live in an urban area now, um, it became apparent to me how difficult it is in, in most areas to get a really good view of the sky with all the stars and the Milky Way. And, you know, it, it's, in, it's incredible. And um, I, a couple of summers ago, really searched. I, there are a couple of, well, there are several dark sky parks around the world. I think there's one in Australia, right. and there's one in New Zealand. And I went to, uh, I went to Death Valley, which uh, wow. has a very dark sky here in, in, near where I live in yeah. California. Even there, we had to work to get to the, the center of the, of the park area where it wasn't near any artificial lights. And it was this quest. And when I finally saw the truly dark sky, it was like nothing I'd ever seen. <laughs> and it, 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 it can have this effect of just like overwhelming you, almost like you're drowning in water. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like exhilarating and also kind of scary at the same time, but it's wonderful to be scared in that primal way. It is overwhelming when yeah. you look up and see just how many stars there are and how small we are in the universe because they are all a sun and they probably all got uh, planets revolving around them and here we are just this one little thing and we don't even know who's out there but you see how many solar systems or galaxies there might be it's truly truly humbling and And I i think about what it what it means with how few places there are to see that now what is it what will it do to human beings to generations of human beings who don't regularly have that experience of yeah. looking up in awe and thinking about our place in the universe. Go to Duncan as well. Good day, Duncan. How you going, Rod? Good day, yeah. Vanessa. You, uh, yeah, yeah, we're coming down from Darwin in the in the road train. Now, do, our... Vanessa may not ex- understand. Just explain to Vanessa what a road train is. Oh well, it's got three trailers behind it. A oh. Big prime mover. So it's a huge truck. 53, yeah, 53 yeah. metres long. Okay. <laughs> and there's thousands, well, thousands. There are dozens, hundreds of these uh, going through um, Outback Australia at any time, these incredible, mm. incredible machines. And uh, how do you work it in the night, Duncan? What's it like, especially with kangaroos or animals oh. jumping out in front of you? Oh, well, you just, you know, I mean, the one thing you can't do is swerve or avoid them. You just have to run over them, and no matter what it is, it's... You can't go swerving around cows or anything, because you, you'll just chip the back trailer over. So how but, fast um, are you going? Uh, at the moment, I'm a fairly rough old piece of road at the back here, uh, so I'm, well, I'm sitting on about 85, 80. Because my, my partner's yeah. trying to sleep in the back. So you uh, that, do five that, hours that, on and five hours off? Yeah, that's what we do all the way down, yeah. We left, um, we left our, when, uh, what time was it? Um about four o'clock on Thursday night, right. and we're down um, probably 10 hours from Dubbo. Wow. And now, tell me, apart from just the animals that you see or hit on the road, what's the difference in driving at night time compared with driving during the daytime? Well, I've passed one vehicle. I, I took over nice. from Charleville. I've been driving for an hour, and I've passed one vehicle, and that's what yeah. I like about it. But um, you get... Uh, silly people that pull up and go to the toilet or whatever and they leave the high beams on oh, yeah. they're sitting on the side of the road and he just jumped out mm. you get that sort of thing happening all the time and um, mostly it's, it's quiet you know the, the other truck driver's coming the other way and he'll just say you know there's cattle here or there's horses there or yeah. or particularly when you're in the territory there's donkeys oh, dear. Um, yeah so <laughs> Okay, Duncan, thanks, mate, and stay safe. Uh, Drive carefully, and thank you very much. 
Vanessa, driving at night is so different to driving during the daytime, especially when you don't see another car. You do feel as though you're the only person on earth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually, oh, I interviewed some uh, some women recently who were on a road trip at night and ended up lost in the woods. <laughs> that that will be coming up soon because that's a, getting lost in in your when you're driving at night versus during the day is a totally different experience because it is really as though you're you're alone. You're just completely alone. Um, and then, of course, as you get older, um, I hear from a lot of people that driving at night just feels m- much less uh, much less safe yes, for them. Yes, indeed. Like, you know. Yeah. I actually have an episode about a trucker, a knock yes. episode called The Hole in the Night, which is quite dramatic with a, a trucker whose truck opened up a sinkhole in the middle of the night during oh. a rainstorm on the, on the interstate. And I, I don't know how people do that kind of work oh, at night. I don't either. And we, we love them, though, because so yeah. many of them listen to us. Uh, Richard, what do you do at night? Good day, Richard. Hello, uh, Vanessa. Hello, Rod. Yeah. Hello. What, um, how are you this morning? Good. We're having a good time. That's good. Um, yeah, what I do is uh, I do a number of things, but uh, I've always kept a diary for all my life, and uh, well, not all my life, uh, for about 40 years. And um, I do a bit of writing, uh, which I enjoy. Uh, I was in the SES, and um, they used to call me out at all hours of the night. And I work for a company that uh, occasionally uh, called me out of the night uh, to uh, drive. And uh, when the um, XPT broke down a few weeks ago, I had to drive up to Albury and back again. Um, And I've got a... um, a book on the uh, internet, um, and uh, I just do it as a hobby. Okay. I'm not. A, I'm not a very good writer. I don't think. Well, but, uh, that's not for you to determine, though, is it, Richard? It's your readers determine whether you're any good or not. That's right. Yeah. Uh, do you write differently at night time compared with the daytime? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of a night, uh, I can concentrate a lot, and uh, okay. well, well, I can't. Uh, of a daytime, it's. Uh, I've got other things to do. Of course. And um, I, it's not as easy to write, but uh, of a night you can uh, concentrate and, uh, on what you've got to do and you can, you're can so much more productive of a night also. All right. Richard, yeah. thank you very much My pleasure. for thank that. You. Oh, sorry, thank you very much. Vanessa, is that right? Is that what you found? I mean, there are obviously some people are far more productive at night, but yeah. for, if you're not used to it, did you find that you were productive at night? I think I can be. I think uh, th- that's an interesting question. I think possibly th- that the night holds that kind of space for more of us than we realize. But that, say for me, I think I was scared to try to do that kind of thing at night because I have such a very ingrained idea of what the night is for from my, most of my yeah. life. I, I turned down at 10 and it was time to sleep. But really, if if you're not exhausted, if you don't actually need the sleep, there is something so uh, wonderful about that space without, like that the gentleman was just saying, so many fewer distractions and the quiet. And I think our brain waves are different and, and are, they're just probably able to, uh, to do different things than we would expect. I, so maybe more of us that are not night owls should, should try that out. Just set, okay. set an alarm. <laughs> so what about with um, some jobs, like cleaning jobs, in big, built like hospitals and businesses, mm. they often take place at night. Yes. So that's also another thing is that they're doing jobs that most of us don't want to do. Yes. So that is also kind of influential in how we feel about those jobs, isn't it? That they take place at night out of the way of the rest of the world. That's a good point. Yeah, we can sort of shunt them off and consider them not only less desirable jobs, but they happen at a quote unquote less desirable time for most people. There's actually also there's a, a, a radio show and podcast from the States here called Reveal, and they did a really fantastic expose on women that clean office buildings at night. And many of them were assaulted sexually over many years. And so they uncovered this whole phenomenon of the danger that a lot of those workers actually face by working at night because... Mm-hmm. They're working alone in these yes. spaces. Our final caller, I think, is Dimity. Hello, Dimity. Good morning or good evening, whatever you care to call it. We just say hello. 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 Okay, hello. You wake up in the night. 
I do. I, well, this morning I woke up at one o'clock and um, I had fallen asleep very early, but I was saying to the gentleman that answered the phone that I have periods of my life where I do this and I it's like that song, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. Yep. I quite welcome that time because it's a time of high creativity, clear thinking. Um, I paint. Mm. I, I draw. Um, I don't know. I do... I can do like six times as many things in a short time as I can, say, sure. at two o'clock in the afternoon. So I don't mind these times. It just seems everyone else does. All right. <laughs> no, thanks, Dimity. And I think distraction is definitely part of that. Vanessa, I know you've got to head off, but I really do appreciate your time. Your podcast is beautiful to listen to as well. And obviously, I mean, we've got a lot of episodes. There's a lot more coming up. There is. There are a lot more coming up. It's just sort of an endless topic, and it's, like I said, this sort of parallel universe, and it's a fascinating place, and I love hearing people's stories and, and all these, you know, really interesting uh, observations that people have about how things are different and the different ways that they can be in the world at night. Vanessa, I hope you come back to Australia, and we'd love to have you back I here do. in the studio. All right. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you. Vanessa Lowe, the name of the podcast is Nocturne. That was an excerpt from Overnights with Rod Quinn from ABC Radio in Australia. Nocturne is produced by me and was created by myself and Kent Sparling, who also composed the theme music. Nick White is our senior editor. Nocturne is distributed by KCRW and also receives support from KCRW's Independent Producer Project. You can find a link to Overnights on our website, nocturnepodcast.org, in the notes for this bonus episode. We'll have another episode of Nocturne for you in a few weeks. Thanks for listening.